A very good morning to you. My name is David Batsoffen and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. At the moment, being a non-travel travel writer, things are very tough uh, for me mentally and I decided to chat to a counselling psychologist, Venice Germanis, who joins me today. Venice, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, David, for having me on this morning. I'm really, really looking forward to chatting to you. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, I'm trying to see what's behind you. There are all sorts of little yeah. knickknacks and things on, in boxes. Yeah. Um, are, they, are they just objects that are special to you? Yeah, they actually, um, you know, different um, aspects that link a little bit more with the spiritual sort of side of things okay. that I also take an interest in. So you'll see there'll be a few different books or cards or a little angelic sort of figures and that type of thing, yeah. Okay, so what I want to talk to you to, uh, about today is the fact that if you look at um, El Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's uh, Five Stages of Grief, I see grief and what we're going through now as um, almost para, they, they mirror each other. Am I, firstly, am I correct in that? And then can we unpack those stages just in a little bit more depth? Mm, absolutely, we can. Um, I would definitely liken it to those stages because when it comes to the stages of grief, it's also about loss, ultimately. And we experience loss in so many different ways, whether it's loss of a relationship, loss in terms of somebody passing away. Um, but especially in this type of scenario, where you find that there's loss experienced in many different ways. There's loss in terms of the lifestyles that we lead that have had to change. There's loss in terms of events that we are not allowed to be part of, that you know, babies are being born, there's funerals that are happening, there's um, weddings, et cetera. All of those things have had to shift as a result of, of the COVID um, scenario. So unfortunately, it's had to change quite a lot, which does, it leads to loss. Now, I, I did mention five stages. And just before we went live, uh, you and I were discussing that there were two more that were added. One is shock and the other one is guilt. So yeah. I'm, I'm the first to raise my hand when this uh, pandemic started. I always joke that in uh, great disaster movies, everything only happens in the Northern Hemisphere. We never have aliens <laughs> landing in South Africa. Nothing happens north of, uh, south of the equator and certainly not this far south in Africa. So I was of the opinion that we would just chill here nicely and nothing would happen to us. And then, shock horror, it did. So yeah. now we find ourselves working through these stages. So let's leave shock and guilt out for now and if we may and just concentrate on the five stages. The first one, of course, is denial. Is it yes. going to happen to us? No, it's not. Oops, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I think there's still probably a lot of people even out there at the moment that are still in denial in that sense of are carrying on with their lives as if nothing's actually taking place around them. Um, you know, I think some people, there's a healthy sense of denial and then there's also unhealthy. So when it comes to that, it's about trying to connect with what our coping me mechanisms are, because there will be different coping mechanisms for everybody. Some mm. that are obviously good ones or healthy ones, should I say rather, um, and other ones that are not so healthy. So it's a matter of how we connect with, with the different things with that. Yes. So there's yeah. ostrich versus non-ostrich, basically. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to put it for sure. Because <laughs> there certainly are. I know of some people that... I think are very defiant and from that end on that extreme end of things where it's like I'm just going to keep going and doing whatever it is that I'm doing and I'm going to pretend that nothing's actually going on also versus those that you know there's so many different conspiracy theories even out there as to um, I think in your your talk last week you spoke to Ruth and about looking at um, how people are going into the conspiracy aspect that this is a hoax mm. um, so then lots of different um, chats about that um, and versus the, also the denial of whether this will happen to you or not yeah especially when it comes a little closer to home then it becomes something that we become way more aware of now the next step and i suppose these these stages of grief don't necessarily run always in a specific order because you can sort of bounce between one or two 
But if you sort of follow Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the next one is anger. And we were, we were angry. Um, we didn't want to be in lockdown. We didn't want to give up our jobs and our lifestyles, uh, whatever those might be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, anger is one of those stages also that people struggle with, probably one of the most. Um, anger is never one of those emotions that we uh, ease through. Uh, we don't often want to be seen as angry types of people, so it can often be suppressed. Sometimes people become more explosive, so we all deal with anger in a very different way. But like you said, because we were almost, we were pretty much forced into this way of being, um, and there was lots of confusion, which also added to that angry space. Yeah. So, it, you know, it all adds up when it comes to that. And also from an anger point of view, you talk about the different ways in which it uh, manifests itself. And I suppose for women and, or men um, who are in abusive situations, because it's not only the women that are in abusive situations, the, that particular those first 21 days must have been terrifying. Absolutely, especially because now you're completely housebound um, and stuck in a situation, which was why it was actually really nice to see how many um, counselors were also offering their time for those people that were in those types of scenarios um, to be able to send different kinds of messages that might be a little bit more on the secretive side, um, to be able to open that up, that space, if they were in trouble. Um, you know, so, but like you said, I mean, it definitely would have compounded the situation because now you're stuck in that um, closed environment. Now, the only one of the stages that I sort of struggled with was bargaining because I thought, what do I have to, to bargain or to barter with? You know, I don't want to offer up my <laughs> wife or my daughter, let them get sick instead of me, you know, because that's normally where the bargaining comes, rather take me or make me ill rather than whoever it is. So is there a comparative um, feeling for bargaining now with, with the pandemic and with lockdown? Sure. And to the if then approach, because bargaining is often related to that, is if this happens, then that happens. If I could just do this, then maybe this would happen. If the government would perhaps just allow me to do this, then I can do that and I can feed my family. So there's, you know, when it comes to bargaining, it is always about those thoughts that go through our mind also about how we might be struggling or to actually understand the situation, because there will be so many different thoughts that we're having to deal with at the same time to try and understand the uncertainty that we're actually facing. And then, of course, there's depression, which is where I found myself two weeks ago. Um, and I'm not one that gets depressed, but it snuck up on me. And I wasn't expecting it. And as I say, I, it's not something that normally happens to me. I can usually bounce through most things. But this hit me like somebody had taken a baseball back to the back of my head. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it's one of the most difficult stages as well with that. I mean, they each have their own um, difficulties when it comes to the, the stages itself. But depression is quite hard because, like you say, most people in that sense, if it does kind of sneak up on you, it's not something you expect. So you're facing that part of it, too. And there's so many aspects about it that we've had to change. So many people, I think, really struggle with the fact that we can't hug another person. You know, touch is limited and touch is something that is so significant for us as human beings. We need that form of touch. And now having to separate ourselves from other people, from social engagements, from connections, especially like what we were talking about just before, was um, looking at the extrovert and the introvert. Um, the extrovert does like to be out there. They like to engage with people. They, they get their energy from that engagement. And now not being able to have that kind of connection with people other than through an online sort of format, it does, it creates greater sadness. There's a depth of sadness as well in terms of, you know, I always think even of the emotions going through like our seasons, we are heading into winter and often people can become more depressed during our winter time because we become more isolated or more in the hibernation sort of phase. Um, it's not to say we get depressed always through that, that space, but it's more the sense of we can often struggle with that um, withdrawal, uh, if I can put it that way. Um, if that makes sense. It, it does. But now, aside from turning to medication of any sort, 
and now that you can buy alcohol again, those who whose uh, <laughs> drug of choice is inverted commas is alcohol. It's freely available, people. Um, is there some are there other tips that you could perhaps suggest to people who are watching this, Denise, that they can use those as just a, a little bit of a crutch to help them get through um, yeah. a, a feeling that they're not used to? Sure. Well, I would highly suggest to avoid the alcohol if you are feeling depressed because it is a depressant, you know, yeah. so it would just be add to that feeling ultimately. But if you are feeling that depressed sort of feeling or the sadness or the depth of the sadness, things like if you are able to connect with nature in any form, whether it is sitting outside on your step or a balcony, somewhere where you can see the trees, the, the beautiful sun that we have during the day when it's nice and warm, um, something where you listen to the birds, being able to connect anyway with nature. Also, now that we are allowed to walk out a little bit more and engage with that when you are running down the street, perhaps have a look and see at the trees that you might be going past. Um, again, uh, talking about running, exercise is one of those things that is incredibly important at the same time to keep yourself motivated and to actually work through. Exercise, like they say, produces those endorphins. So we are able to connect more with the happier or the lighter side of things when we are moving. Um, reading your favorite things, if there's something that you're particularly interested in. Music, again, is another one. Um, people also turn to things like relaxation exercises, breathing exercises, yoga, meditation. Those aspects are also highly powerful when it comes to looking at uh, working with the sadness or the depression or talking to a close friend. At the same time, there are counselors and psychologists and social workers and wonderful people out there that are also there to support. So, you know, have a look at those. There's a lot of toll free lines if you can't connect with a, a professional itself in terms of a um, psychologist or social worker to get to an appointment. But if there's amazing people that are also on uh, there for Lifeline or the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. Um, so all of those aspects are really good to help people or to create a supportive structure for people during this time. And then, which we, a lot of us find ourselves right now, comes anger. We've been, what, 68 days in lockdown, there or thereabouts. And people, to, to coin a South Africanism, we're hutful, basically. We've yeah. had enough. People can't explain to us why you can have alcohol, you can't have cigarettes. You can buy shoes, but you can't buy open-toed shoes. You can't go and have a haircut, but you can take your dog to the pooch parlor. There seems to be <laughs> no, no congruity, no consistency in the, in the decisions that are made. And then when mm -hmm. questioned, those few who are now controlling the many are literally doing what a generation of parents did many, many years ago when I was growing up, which was because is an entire sentence. I'd say to my folks, can I do X? And they go, no. And I'd go, why? And normally my mom would say, because. And that was the end of it. it there was no explanation necessary. Because was a whole sentence. And we gave you because at the, at the moment. And, and we are angry, and I don't think we, we, we're not looking for civil unrest, but it's starting mm. to bubble under because people have gone, you know what, we've been really compliant for all this time, and now you hide. You talk to us once every two weeks, and for the rest, we don't know where our president is. We don't know who's running the country, or why the people that are seem to be running the country, have the power that they do. Mm. Absolutely. Um, you know, I was listening to a talk last night also that was saying, I think we have actually reached the magical number of day 70 at this stage. Um, so I thought, wow, you know, when people actually, there are people that are, they're counting every single day when it comes to that sort of focus. And I thought, you know, I think I did that for the first few weeks and then I eventually said, okay, I can't anymore. Uh, I'm just going to take it day by day, literally. And like you say, it is, I think, because there's so much uncertainty. There's so much fake news also. There's so much restriction that's being placed that people don't understand. And for me, the way to work with that ultimately is just to think about what you can control. 
there are a lot of things that we can't control and that can bring about that anger the more we focus on that aspect, on the lack aspect, what we don't have. But when you can focus on what we're gaining or what we are actually able to do, you feel more empowered. So that for me has always been the, the greater focus is if you can, is just focus on what you can actually do and you find the freedom within the restriction. So I think that's what people fight up against usually when it comes to anger is that restriction. I feel totally restricted. I feel trapped. I can't do anything. I don't know. I feel helpless is the overarching you know, emotion that usually comes out with it. But when you bring it back in terms of anger can actually be incredibly motivating at the same time to actually, if you channel it, to move it in the right direction, to actually motivate yourself to move forward with what you can do. Many people are creating new ideas, new businesses, um, moving more online platforms, creating greater communication with other people, uh, different types of skills, you know, just seeing how many people are creating masks now, for example, with all the different designs and uh, things like that. I think, wow, how amazingly creative is that? Uh, just to find a way to move forward, ultimately. And literally in just a few days, from having no masks in, in South Africa to having a plethora of masks in, in yeah. sort of in cultural colors and all sorts of things. It's, it, it really is. It, it is wonderful how, how resilient I think humans are. Yes, we do. We bitch and we moan and we complain. But underneath there is a still, all right, we're, we're in this. Some of us are in it together. Others are, hmm. are in it vicariously because if you're a, if you're a multi-billionaire living in a, in a home on the top of a hill, does this really bother you? No. But if you somebody who is sort of the general public, yes, it is a battle. You've lost your job. Uh, places are closing. They can't open. Nobody knows. So it is. It's, it's, it's anger and depression seem to almost go hand in hand with each other and yeah. cycle through each other, Vanessa. Absolutely. You know, there's so many people that often believe also that uh, depression is just anger that's turned inward. Right. There's a sense that it actually just needs a space to express itself. Because like I said, you know, people really struggle with anger in general. Most of the time we are actually resistant to that particular emotion because what it might mean for us. But it's about being able to find a healthy way to connect with anger. Um, I do believe that, you know, no emotion is a bad emotion or a good emotion. It simply is what it is. And if you can actually connect with the different emotions to see what they have to offer you to actually know, you know, I'm feeling angry, what's happening for me, what's going on. Anger is a warning sign. It's kind of telling you something's off and something needs to be looked at. Um, so when it comes to those emotions, it's just how we deal with them you know, when it comes to the healthy or unhealthy ways of expressing them in, in that form. But like you say, you know, I don't doubt that people that are on the wealthier end have their own stresses as opposed to those that are on the poorer end, that we each are dealing with different things. Um, I always liked, there was a quote that went out a little while ago saying, we're not all in the same boat, but we are in the same storm. And I thought that was such a nice way of actually putting it, is we are in the same storm, but we might all be in different boats and it's just how we're dealing with those different boats as well, what might be on those boats and each boat needs maintenance. <laughs> so it's also <laughs> how we actually connect with, with those different aspects of it. True enough. Now, what happens, um, we've now covered all the five stages. So now, uh, do uh, Sorry, David, the other one is acceptance. Oh, so, uh, acceptance. sorry, I'd forgotten about that, acceptance. But so what happens now now we we just go all right so we're in it for the long haul um thanks to if you've read uh, hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy goodbye and thanks for all the fish and the, the <laughs> magic number is 42 i don't know if that's days months or years yeah. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> maybe maybe this is goodbye um 2020 and let's just worry about 2021 and see what happens then yeah, sure. So many people have said, you know, I wish I could just simply reboot this year or forget about this year. But what if it's the most important year that we've had thus far? You know, maybe it's the year that actually allows us to stop and reflect on where things are going and what we actually want in our lives. Um, looking at the types of relationships, the types of careers we want, uh, you know, talking to various people about how they've had more time to connect with their families. 
because they've had to be at home. Yeah. So they do now have, as much as they're working from home, they've had more opportunity to actually sit around a, t a dinner table and actually talk about things. Um, so it has certainly had its advantages with that and being able to reconnect, sometimes more reconnecting even with self because we are more rest restricted in terms of what we would normally be doing, rushing about from one thing to the next. So, you know, it does also add to that, that pattern and being able to look at, can we look at the things that we actually want to move away from or let go of and bring in something new? And what are the things that we'd actually like to bring in? So 2020, as much as it's quite a, as it has certainly been a huge challenge and quite traumatic for a lot of people, is looking at how can we use this and we might only be able to look at it <laughs> in hindsight <laughs> but to being able to actually see how it's actually been beneficial for us because at the moment it's hard and when it is hard it's hard to see anything beyond that um, but when we look back on it it's obviously a little easier so now if we uh, now thank you for that um we've got through acceptance will we start recycling the stages again or once you've got to acceptance, that's it. You can just sort of go, right, been there, done the five stages, let's just move on. And, and <laughs> you know, rock on, we'll, we'll tackle anything head on now. Or will we go back and maybe get angry again or, or depressed, all of those sort of things? Sure, like you, say, like you said at the start, we do go through different stages at different times. There isn't a set format of we go through stage one, two, three, four, five, and it's finished kind of thing. It would be lovely, I suppose, if you can say, <laughs> now I've got the acceptance and now I can just simply move on. But like you said, something else might come up to trigger something else. Uh, every, people like to describe it often as the onion and you look at the different layers. So something else might come up for you to have a look at and it might take you back to a different aspect or, or different stage. People will also, within the stages, they'll be in those different stages for different amounts of time. Some people can, I think, can go through all five stages in one day or in a week, and then they'll go back again, and then they'll spend time greater in one of the stages at a longer period of time than some of the others, just because we are all different. We have our unique way of, of dealing with things and how we actually cope. Also, how we actually get help from other people too and create a support system for ourselves, I think is a big part or big role in um, working through those stages. Venice, I think you've answered my questions so beautifully and I thank you so much for the time that you've given me um, and the people that are going to watch this. And I do hope that uh, if people have taken a moment, uh, firstly, if they want to contact you, um, yeah. how do they go about it? Um, well, usually I am working in a private practice here in the south of Joburg, uh, so they're welcome to contact me through that. They can email me, they can send um, or give me a call if they'd like to chat further. Um, at the moment, I don't have a website, I'm working on that, so we'll see hopefully in the near future we'll have this, those kind of things up and running. But yeah, generally they should be able to just put in my name into Google and they'll find my details. Great stuff. Venice Germanis, who is a counseling psycholo um, psychologist. Thank you so much for your time. I've uh, been in conversation with Venice and uh, we've been chatting about the stages of grief versus the stages of lockdown. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you so much, David. Really, it's such a uh, pleasure and a privilege to be able to share this morning. So thank you so very, very much for that opportunity. Really, thank you very much.